Section 4 of Aspects of Love, an Anthology. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Symposium by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. When Agathon had done speaking, Aristodemus said that there was a general cheer. The young man was thought to have spoken in a manner worthy of himself and of the god. And Socrates, looking at Eryximachus, said, Tell me, son of Acumenus, was there not reason in my fears? And was I not a true prophet when I said that Agathon would make a wonderful oration, and that I should be in a strait? The part of the prophecy which concerns Agathon, replied Eryximachus, appears to me to be true, but not the other part, that you will be in a strait. Why, my dear friend, said Socrates, must not I, or any one, be in a strait who has to speak after he has heard such a rich and varied discourse? I am especially struck with the beauty of the concluding words. Who could listen to them without amazement? When I reflected on the immeasurable inferiority of my own powers, I was ready to run away for shame, if there had been a possibility of escape for I was reminded of Gorgias, and at the end of his speech I fancied that Agathon was shaking at me the Gorginian, or Gorgonian, head of the great master of rhetoric, which was simply to turn me and my speech into stone, as Homer says, and strike me dumb. And then I perceived how foolish I had been in consenting to take my turn with you in praising love, and saying that I too was a master of the art, when I really had no conception how anything ought to be praised. For in my simplicity I imagined that the topics of praise should be true, and that this being presupposed, out of the true the speaker was to choose the best, and set them forth in the best manner. And I felt quite proud, thinking that I knew the nature of true praise, and should speak well. Whereas I now see that the intention was to attribute to love every species of greatness and glory, whether really belonging to him or not, without regard to truth or falsehood. That was no matter for the original proposal seems to have been not that each of you should really praise love, but only that you should appear to praise him. And so you attribute to love every imaginable form of praise which can be gathered anywhere, and you say that he is all this, and the cause of all that, making him appear the fairest and best of all to those who know him not, for you cannot impose upon those who know him. And a noble and solemn hymn of praise have you rehearsed. But as I misunderstood the nature of the praise, when I said that I would take my turn, I must beg to be absolved from the promise which I made in ignorance, and which, as Euripides would say, was a promise of the lips, and not of the mind. Farewell, then, to such a strain, for I do not praise in that way. No, indeed, I cannot. But if you like to hear the truth about love, I am ready to speak in my own manner, though I will not make myself ridiculous by entering into any rivalry with you. Say then, Phaedrus, whether you would like to have the truth about love. 
spoken in any words and in any order which may happen to come into my mind at the time will that be agreeable to you aristodemus said that phaedrus and the company bid him speak in any manner which he thought best then he added let me have your permission first to ask agathon a few more questions in order that i may take his admissions as the premises of my discourse i grant the permission said phaedrus put your questions socrates then proceeded as follows in the magnificent oration which you have just uttered i think that you were right my dear agathon in proposing to speak of the nature of love first and afterwards of his works that is a way of beginning which i very much approve and as you have spoken so eloquently of his nature may i ask you further whether love is the love of something or of nothing and here i must explain myself i do not want you to say that love is the love of a father or the love of a mother <laughs> that would be ridiculous but to answer as you would if i asked is a father a father of something uh, to which you would find no difficulty in replying of a son or daughter and the answer would be right very true said agathon and you would say the same of a mother he assented yet let me ask you one more question in order to illustrate my meaning is not a brother to be regarded essentially as a brother of something certainly he replied that is of a brother or sister yes he said and now said socrates i will ask about love is love of something or of nothing of something surely he replied keep in mind what this is and tell me what i want to know whether love desires that of which love is yes surely and does he possess or does he not possess that which he loves and desires probably not i should say nay replied socrates i would have you consider whether necessarily is not rather the word the inference that he who desires something is in want of something and that he who desires nothing is in want of nothing is in my judgment agathon absolutely and necessarily true what do you think i agree with you said agathon very good would he who is great desire to be great or he who is strong desire to be strong that would be inconsistent with our previous admissions true for he who is anything cannot want to be that which he is very true and yet added socrates if a man being strong desired to be strong or being swift desired to be swift or being healthy desired to be healthy in that case he might be thought to desire something which he already has or is i give the example in order that we may avoid misconception 
for the possessors of these qualities agathon must be supposed to have their respective advantages at the time whether they choose or not and who can desire that which he has therefore when a person says i am well and wish to be well or i am rich and wish to be rich and i desire simply to have what i have to him we shall reply you my friend having wealth and health and strength want to have the continuance of them for at this moment whether you choose or no you have them and when you say i desire that which i have and nothing else is not your meaning that you want to have what you now have in the future he must agree with us must he not he must replied agathon then said socrates he desires that what he has at present may be preserved to him in the future which is equivalent to saying that he desires something which is non-existent to him and which as yet he has not got very true he said then he and every one who desires desires that which he has not already and which is future and not present and which he has not and is not and of which he is in want these are the sort of things which love and desire seek very true he said then now said socrates let us recapitulate the argument first is not love of something and of something too which is wanting to a man yes he replied remember further what you said in your speech or if you do not remember i will remind you you said that the love of the beautiful set in order the empire of the gods for that of deformed things there is no love did you not say something of that kind yes said agathon yes my friend and the remark was a just one and if this is true love is the love of beauty and not of deformity he assented and the admission has been already made that love is of something which a man wants and has not true he said then love wants and has not beauty certainly he replied and would you call that beautiful which wants and does not possess beauty certainly not then would you still say that love is beautiful then would you still say that love is beautiful certainly not then would you still say that love is beautiful agathon replied i fear that i did not understand what i was saying you made a very good speech agathon replied socrates but there is yet one small question which i would fain ask is not the good also the beautiful yes then in wanting the beautiful love wants also the good i cannot refute you socrates said agathon let us assume that what you say is true say rather beloved agathon that you cannot refute the truth 
for Socrates is easily refuted. And now, taking my leave of you, I would rehearse a tale of love which I heard from Diotima of Mantinea, a woman wise in this and in many other kinds of knowledge, who in the days of old, when the Athenians offered sacrifice before the coming of the plague, delayed the disease ten years. She was my instructress in the art of love, and I shall repeat to you what she said to me, beginning with the admissions made by Agathon, which are nearly, if not quite, the same, which I made to the wise woman when she questioned me. I think that this will be the easiest way, and I shall take both parts myself as well as I can. As you, Agathon, suggested, I must speak first of the being and nature of love, and then of his works. First I said to her, in nearly the same words which he used to me, that love was a mighty god, and likewise fair. And she proved to me, as I proved to him, that by my own showing, love was neither fair nor good what do you mean dear toma i said is love then evil and foul hush she cried must that be foul which is not fair certainly i said and is that which is not wise ignorant do you not see that there is a mean between wisdom and ignorance, and <coughs> do you not see that there is a mean between wisdom and ignorance? And what may that be? I said. Right opinion, she replied which, as you know, being incapable of giving a reason, is not knowledge, for how can knowledge be devoid of reason, nor again ignorance, for neither can ignorance attain the truth, but is clearly something which is a mean between ignorance and wisdom. Quite true, I replied. Do not then insist, she said, that what is not fair is of necessity foul, or what is not good evil, or infer that because love is not fair and good, he is therefore foul and evil, for he is in a mean between them. Well, I said, love is surely admitted by all to be a great god by those who know or by those who do not know by all and how socrates she said with a smile can love be acknowledged to be a great god by those who say that he is not a god at all and who are they I said, you and I are two of them, she replied. How can that be? I said. It is quite intelligible, she replied, for you yourself would acknowledge that the gods are happy and fair. Of course you would. Would you dare to say that any god was not? Certainly not, I replied. And you mean by the happy those who are the possessors of things good or fair yes and you admitted that love because he was in want desires those good and fair things of which he is in want yes i did 
but how can he be a god who has no portion in what is either good or fair impossible then you see that you also deny the divinity of love what then is love i asked is he mortal no what then as in the former instance he is neither mortal nor immortal but in a mean between the two what is he diotima he is a great spirit daimon and like all spirits he is intermediate between the divine and the mortal and what i said is his power he interprets she replied between gods and men conveying and taking across to the gods the prayers and sacrifices of men and to men the commands and replies of the gods he is the mediator who spans the chasm which divides them and therefore in him all is bound together and through him the arts of the prophet and the priest their sacrifices and mysteries and charms and all prophecy and incantation find their way for god mingles not with man but through love all the intercourse and converse of god with man whether awake or asleep is carried on the wisdom which understands this is spiritual all other wisdom such as that of arts and handicrafts is mean and vulgar now these spirits or intermediate powers are many and diverse and one of them is love and who i said was his father and who his mother the tale she said will take time nevertheless i will tell you on the birthday of aphrodite there was a feast of the gods at which the god poros or plenty who is the son of metis or discretion was one of the guests when the feast was over penia or poverty as the manner is on such occasions came about the doors to beg now plenty who was the worse for nectar there was no wine in those days went into the garden of zeus and fell into a heavy sleep and poverty considering her own straitened circumstances plotted to have a child by him and accordingly she lay down at his side and conceived love who partly because he is naturally a lover of the beautiful and because aphrodite is herself beautiful and also because he was born on her birthday is her follower and attendant and as his parentage is so also are his fortunes in the first place he is always poor and anything but tender and fair as the many imagine him and he is rough and squalid and has no shoes nor a house to dwell in on the bare earth exposed he lies under the open heaven in the streets or at the doors of houses taking his rest and like his mother he is always in distress like his father too whom he also partly resembles he is always plotting against the fair and good he is bold enterprising strong a mighty hunter always weaving some intrigue or other keen in the pursuit of wisdom fertile in resources a philosopher at all times terrible as an enchanter sorcerer sophist 
he is by nature neither mortal nor immortal but alive and flourishing at one moment when he is in plenty and dead at another moment and again alive by reason of his father's nature but that which is always flowing in is always flowing out and so he is never in want and never in wealth and further he is in a mean between ignorance and knowledge the truth of the matter is this no god is a philosopher or seeker after wisdom for he is wise already nor does any man who is wise seek after wisdom neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom for herein is the evil of ignorance that he who is neither good nor wise is nevertheless satisfied with himself he has no desire for that of which he feels no want but who then diotima i said are the lovers of wisdom if they are neither the wise nor the foolish a child may answer that question she replied they are those who are in a mean between the two a love is one of them for wisdom is a most beautiful thing and love is of the beautiful and therefore love is also a philosopher or lover of wisdom and being a lover of wisdom is in a mean between the wise and the ignorant and of this too his birth is the cause for his father is wealthy and wise and his mother poor and foolish such my dear socrates is the nature of the spirit love the error in your conception of him was very natural and as i imagine from what you say has arisen out of a confusion of love and the beloved which made you think that love was all beautiful for the beloved is the truly beautiful and delicate and perfect and blessed but the principle of love is of another nature and is such as i have described i said o oh, thou stranger woman thou sayest well but assuming love to be such as you say what is the use of him to man that socrates she replied i will attempt to unfold of his nature and birth i have already spoken and you acknowledge that love is of the beautiful but some one will say of the beautiful in what socrates and diotima or rather let me put the question more clearly and ask when a man loves the beautiful what does he desire i answered her that the beautiful may be his still she said the answer suggests a further question what is given by the possession of beauty to what you have asked i replied i have no answer ready then she said let me put the word good in the place of the beautiful and repeat the question once more if he who loves loves the good what is it then that he loves the possession of the good i said and what does he gain who possesses the good happiness i replied there is less difficulty in answering that question yes she said the happy are made happy by the acquisition of good things nor is there any need to ask why a man desires happiness the answer is already final you are right i said and is this wish and this desire common to all and do all men always desire their own good or only some men 
what say you all men i replied the desire is common to all why then she rejoined are not all men socrates said to love but only some of them whereas you say that all men are always loving the same things i myself wonder i said why this is there is nothing to wonder at she replied the reason is that one part of love is separated off and receives the name of the whole but the other parts have other names give an illustration i said she answered me as follows there is poetry which as you know is complex and manifold all creation or passage of non-being into being is poetry or making and the processes of all art are creative and the masters of arts are all poets or makers very true still she said you know that they are not called poets but have other names only that portion of the art which is separated off from the rest and is concerned with music and metre is termed poetry and they who possess poetry in this sense of the word are called poets very true i said and the same holds of love for you may say generally that all desire of good and happiness is only the great and subtle power of love but they who are drawn towards him by any other path whether the path of money-making or gymnastics or philosophy are not called lovers the name of the whole is appropriated to those whose affection takes one form only they alone are said to love or to be lovers i dare say i replied that you are right yes she added and you hear people say that lovers are seeking for their other half but i say that they are seeking neither for the half of themselves nor for the whole unless the half or the whole be also a good and they will cut off their own hands and feet and cast them away if they are evil for they love not what is their own unless perchance there be some one who calls what belongs to him the good and what belongs to another the evil for there is nothing which men love but the good is there anything uh, certainly i should say that there is nothing then she said the simple truth is that men love the good yes i said to which must be added that they love the possession of the good yes that must be added and not only the possession but the everlasting possession of the good that must be added too then love she said may be described generally as the love of the everlasting possession of the good that is most true then if this be the nature of love can you tell me further she said what is the manner of the pursuit what are they doing who show all this eagerness and heat which is called love and what is the object which they have in view answer me nay diotima i replied if i had known I should not have wondered at your wisdom, neither should I have come to learn from you about this very matter. Well, she said, I will teach you. The object which they have in view is birth in beauty, 
whether of body or soul. I do not understand you, I said. The oracle requires an explanation. I will make my meaning clearer, she replied. I mean to say that all men are bringing to the birth in their bodies and in their souls. There is a certain age at which human nature is desirous of procreation, procreation which must be in beauty and not in deformity, and this procreation is the union of man and woman and is a divine thing, for conception and generation are an immortal principle in the mortal creature and in the inharmonious they can never be. But the deformed is always inharmonious with the divine, and the beautiful harmonious. Beauty, then, is the destiny or goddess of parturition who presides at birth, and therefore, when approaching beauty, the conceiving power is propitious, and diffusive and benign and begets and bears fruit at the sight of ugliness she frowns and contracts and has a sense of pain and turns away and shrivels up and not without a pang refrains from conception and this is the reason why when the hour of conception arrives and the teeming nature is full there is such a flutter and ecstasy about beauty, whose approach is the alleviation of the pain of travail. For love, Socrates, is not, as you imagine, the love of the beautiful only. What then? The love of generation and of birth in beauty. Yes, I said. Yes, indeed, she replied why of generation because to the mortal creature generation is a sort of eternity and immortality she replied and if as has been already admitted love is of the everlasting possession of the good all men will necessarily desire immortality together with good wherefore love is of immortality all this she taught me at various times when she spoke of love and i remember her once saying to me what is the cause socrates of love and the attendant desire see you not how all animals birds as well as beasts in their desire of procreation are in agony when they take the infection of love, which begins with the desire of union, whereto is added the care of offspring, on whose behalf the weakest are ready to battle against the strongest, even to the uttermost, and to die for them, and will let themselves be tormented with hunger, or suffer anything in order to maintain their young. Man may be supposed to act thus from reason but why should animals have these passionate feelings can you tell me why again i replied that i did not know she said to me and do you expect ever to become a master in the art of love if you do not know this but i have told you already diotima that my ignorance is the reason why i come to you for I am conscious that I want to teach it. Tell me, then, the cause of this and of the other mysteries of love. Marvel not, she said, if you believe that love is of the immortal, as we have several times acknowledged, for here again, and on the same principle, too, the mortal nature is seeking as far as is possible to be everlasting and immortal and this is only to be attained by generation because generation always leaves behind a new existence in the place of the old nay 
even in the life of the same individual there is succession and not absolute unity a man is called the same and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age and in which every animal is said to have life and identity he is undergoing a perpetual process of loss and reparation hair flesh bones blood and the whole body are always changing which is true not only of the body but also of the soul whose habits tempers opinions desires pleasures pains fears never remain the same in any one of us but are always coming and going and equally true of knowledge and what is still more surprising to us mortals not only do the sciences in general spring up and decay so that in respect of them we are never the same but each of them individually experiences a like change for what is implied in the word recollection but the departure of knowledge which is ever being forgotten and is renewed and preserved by recollection and appears to be the same although in reality new according to that law of succession by which all mortal things are preserved not absolutely the same but by substitution the old worn-out mortality leaving another new and similar existence behind unlike the divine which is always the same and not another and in this way socrates the mortal body or mortal anything partakes of immortality but the immortal in another way marvel not then at the love which all men have of their offspring for that universal love and interest is for the sake of immortality i was astonished at her words and said is this really true o thou wise diotima and she answered with all the authority of an accomplished sophist of that socrates you may be assured think only of the ambition of men and you will wonder at the senselessness of their ways unless you consider how they are stirred by the love of an immortality of fame they are ready to run all risks greater far than they would have run for their children and to spend money and undergo any sort of toil and even to die for the sake of leaving behind them a name which shall be eternal do you imagine that alcestis would have died to save admetus or achilles to revenge patroclus or your own codrus in order to preserve the kingdom for his sons if they had not imagined that the memory of their virtues which still survives among us would be immortal nay she said i am persuaded that all men do all things and the better they are the more they do them in hope of the glorious fame of immortal virtue for they desire the immortal those who are pregnant in the body only betake themselves to women and beget children this is the character of their love their offspring as they hope will preserve their memory and giving them the blessedness and immortality which they desire in the future but souls which are pregnant for there certainly are men who are more creative in their souls than in their bodies conceive that which is proper for the soul to conceive or contain and what are these conceptions wisdom and virtue in general and such creators are poets and all artists who are deserving of the name inventor but the greatest and fairest sort of wisdom by far is that which is concerned with the ordering of states and families and which is called temperance and justice 
and he who in youth has the seed of these implanted in him and is himself inspired when he comes to maturity desires to beget and generate he wanders about seeking beauty that he may beget offspring for in deformity he will beget nothing and naturally embraces the beautiful rather than the deformed body above all when he finds a fair and noble and well-nurtured soul he embraces the two in one person and to such an one he is full of speech about virtue and the nature and pursuits of a good man and he tries to educate him and at the touch of the beautiful which is ever present to his memory even when absent he brings forth that which he had conceived long before and in company with him tends that which he brings forth and they are married by a far nearer tie and have a closer friendship than those who beget mortal children for the children who are their common offspring are fairer and more immortal who when he thinks of homer and hesiod and other great poets would not rather have their children than ordinary human ones who would not emulate them in the creation of children such as theirs which have preserved their memory and given them everlasting glory or who would not have such children as lycurgus left behind him to be the saviours not only of lacedaemon but of hellas as one may say there is solon too who is the revered father of athenian laws and many others there are in many other places both among hellenes and barbarians who have given to the world many noble works and have been the parents of virtue of every kind and many temples have been raised in their honour for the sake of children such as theirs which were never raised in honour of any one for the sake of his mortal children these are the lesser mysteries of love into which even you socrates may enter to the greater and more hidden ones which are the crown of these and to which if you pursue them in a right spirit they will lead i know not whether you will be able to attain but i will do my utmost to inform you and do you follow if you can for he who will proceed aright in this matter should begin in youth to visit beautiful forms and first if he be guided by his instructor aright to love one such form only out of that he should create fair thoughts and soon he will of himself perceive that the beauty of one form is akin to the beauty of another and then if beauty of form in general is his pursuit how foolish would he be not to recognize that the beauty in every form is one and the same and when he perceives this he will abate his violent love of the one which he will despise and deem a small thing and will become a lover of all beautiful forms in the next stage he will consider that the beauty of the mind is more honourable than the beauty of the outward form so that if a virtuous soul have but a little comeliness he will be content to love and tend him and will search out and bring to the birth thoughts which may improve the young until he is compelled to contemplate and see the beauty of institutions and laws and to understand that the beauty of them all is of one family and that personal beauty is a trifle and after laws and after institutions he will go on to the sciences that he may see their beauty being not like a servant in love with the beauty of one youth or man or institution himself a slave mean and narrow-minded but drawing towards and contemplating the vast sea of beauty 
he will create many fair and noble thoughts and notions in boundless love of wisdom until on that shore he grows and waxes strong and at last the vision is revealed to him of a single science which is the science of beauty everywhere to this i will proceed please to give me your very best attention he who has been instructed thus far in the things of love and who has learned to see the beautiful in due order and succession when he comes toward the end will suddenly perceive a nature of wondrous beauty and this socrates is the final cause of all our former toils a nature which in the first place is everlasting not growing and decaying or waxing and waning secondly not fair in one point of view and foul in another or at one time or in one relation or at one place fair at another time or in another relation or at another place foul as if fair to some and foul to others or in the likeness of a face or hands or any other part of the bodily frame or in any form of speech or knowledge or existing in any other being as for example in an animal or in heaven or in earth or in any other place but beauty absolute separate simple and everlasting which without diminution and without increase or any change is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of all other things he who from these ascending under the influence of true love begins to perceive that beauty is not far from the end and the true order of going or being led by another to the things of love is to begin from the beauties of earth and mount upwards for the sake of that other beauty using these as steps only and from one going on to two and from two to all fair forms and from fair forms to fair practices and from fair practices to fair notions until from fair notions he arrives at the notion of absolute beauty and at last knows what the essence of beauty is this my dear socrates said the stranger of mantinea is that life above all others which man should live in the contemplation of beauty absolute a beauty which if you once beheld you would see not to be after the measure of gold and garments and fair boys and youths whose presence now entrances you and you and many a one would be content to live seeing them only and conversing with them without meat or drink if that were possible you only want to look at them and to be with them but what if man had eyes to see the true beauty the divine beauty i mean pure and clear and unalloyed not clogged with the pollutions of mortality and all the colours and vanities of human life thither looking and holding converse with the true beauty simple and divine remember how in that communion only beholding beauty with the eye of the mind he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty but realities for he has hold not of an image but of a reality and bringing forth and nourishing true virtue to become the friend of god and be immortal if mortal man may would that be an ignoble life such phaedrus and i speak not only to you but to all of you were the words of diotima and i am persuaded of their truth and being persuaded of them i try to persuade others that in the attainment of this end human nature will not easily find a helper better than love and therefore also i say 
that every man ought to honour him as i myself honour him and walk in his ways and exhort others to do the same and praise the power and spirit of love according to the measure of my ability now and ever the words which i have spoken you phaedrus may call an encomium of love or anything else which you please End of section 4